This lecture is going to be about invasive species. Um, get started right away. If I can here. Not sure what's going on. An invasive species, what we're talking about um, on invasive species, is a species that somehow got to an area where it's not native and now is doing well. So if we look at the definition from the book. It's an invasive species. is one that arrives often with human assistance in a habitat that is not previously occupied then establish a population and spreads autonomously, meaning on their own. Uh, they're serious threats. Uh, they're considered the second highest reason for our current extinction crisis and they're really not far behind habitat destruction and fragmentation, which we've talked about a little bit already. Uh, this shows actually marine invasive species and how they've been moved around. Uh, obviously fish can move, but invertebrates uh, have been moved by ships um, and, and a lot of other animals have been moved by ships as well as we're going to learn. Islands are most often affected. Um, for instance, in Hawaiian Islands, almost half the plant species 25% of insects, 40% of birds, and most freshwater fishes are introduced. Uh, if you look at Florida, which obviously isn't an island, but it's a peninsula, so they have uh, worse they have worse problems with uh, invasive. They're, invasives are also called exotics. Um, Florida, 27% plant species instead of 58 insects, 5% birds, and 25%. Um, this, if this link would show you the major species in Hawaii. Um, this is a video um, that actually shows cattlemen that are having to fight uh, an exotic plant. Uh, I would um, advise you to watch that. I'm going to try and skip over some of these just in the interest of time. New Zealand, obviously a, a country but also an island. Uh, there were really only three native mammals there and they were bats. Now there's over 30 more introduced mammals. Uh, this guy, the Australian bush-tailed possum, uh, is in the millions. Uh, it's destroying broadleaf forest. Uh, it's eating native bird eggs and chicks. Uh, rats are extremely destructive uh, on isle in many places, uh, including New Zealand. The stoat, this is a stoat, they, we would call them a short-tailed weasel in North America. We have some in northern uh, Alaska, have some, Canada, and some of the northern states. We have the long-tailed weasel. But they're called the stoat in Europe, and a uh, hedgehog are widespread. They prey on native birds, reptiles, and insects. European red deer is one of many ungulates, but uh, European red deer is the same thing as an elk. It's the most numerous and overgrazed many areas. Feral pigs have caused huge problems, not only in New Zealand, but a lot of other countries. Uh, in addition, there are 120 exotic birds, um, 35 of which have been become highly successful. European brown trout, although it brings in a lot of money from tourists for fishing, uh, is called local extirpation of many of the native fish species. And there's been all over 1,200 introduced plants which have changed forest ecosystems throughout the country. So New Zealand is it's not as bad as Hawaii, but it's, it's, it's got some real problems. And fortunately, it's very, very difficult to do anything about it. Um, invasive species can modify the ecosystem. This is a, an example in uh, Tierra del Fuego in uh, Chile and Argentina. Uh, there were a few North American beavers introduced theirs in 1946. Uh, and so they've turned a forest that had a stream going through it now into a swamp uh, with grasses and sedges. Uh, now on the Florida or Everglades, where you had a swamp with grasses and sedges, you've had the exact opposite because of an introduced uh, Australian paper bark tree, which unfortunately has turned the swamp uh, into grass, uh, shrimp grasslands, into forest in many areas. Water hyacinth, this is one of the huge problems in Africa, uh, but much north of where we're going to go, mainly Central Africa. It's, it's a, a tropical origin species. Um, 
covers much of, of Lake Victoria. It covered much more. They found some ways to successfully fight, which we'll come back to. Uh, it's also covered many lakes and, and rivers in the southeastern U.S., uh, various water bodies in Asia and Australia. Uh, and it just smothers and, and the native submerged vegetation doesn't allow the native vegetation to get light. Uh, that causing vast quantities of, of, of rotting vegetation plus rotting water hyacinth uh, causes the bacteria break that hyacinth and, and rotting vegetation down. The bacteria take all the oxygen out of the water so you have essentially what's called a dead zone. So you have very low oxygen which eventually kills the fish. Uh, there's been a similar overgrowth in the Mediterranean Sea with an algae that's from the tropical southwest Pacific uh, and has replaced seagrass meadows over thousands of hectares which not only are the is the plant community changed but you can imagine the animal community just drastically changed when you take away their native habitat. Uh, oftentimes diseases are introduced um, in different ways. Uh, in our own country you had the uh, chestnut blight uh, in the 30s, the 1930s that is, uh, this was one of the most common trees in the eastern deciduous forest. Uh, about 30% of the forest uh, was chestnuts. Unfortunately, this uh, blight uh, wiped out almost all of them. Uh, chestnut was an extremely important part of the forest ecosystem not only for the birds and mammals that live there, uh, the food source out of chestnuts, uh, but it also um, produced a lot of leaves that decomposed um, and uh, very rapidly and, and was part of the nutrient recycling system, which is now slowed down because oak leaves don't decompose near as fast, uh, which has slowed tree growth down. Uh, and this is from uh, an, an Asian uh, disease. Uh, oftentimes there's competition between exotics or invasive species and natives. Uh, our North American gray squirrel, you can see in this photo here in the center, uh, unfortunately is replacing uh, two native squirrels, one in the, in the U United Kingdom, the other in Italy, which is this very pretty tassel-eared red squirrel. Uh, the house gecko, which is from Southeast Asia, uh, is causing a decline. Here you can see two are killing one of the native lizards and fighting over which one is going to eat it. Um, a lot of invasive species are very aggressive uh, and the native animals have no defense. They didn't evolve uh, with an, such an aggressive species. Uh, the red fire ant, uh, I'm from the southeast so I know all about them. Uh, hideous species. Uh, I will click on this link here in a second. Uh, greatly reduced native ant populations in the U.S. Uh, along with several other insect species. Then we have this problem right here in Arizona. That's the zebra mussels. Uh, they settle on top of, of North American mussels and their threads surround them and, and actually suffocate them. They're clogging up pipes causing millions and millions of economic damage. So let's go here. I already had it open once. Uh, it's time to find a place where the height of things is measured for so something big. A place yeah, where once in a lifetime to leave the everyday, everyday but every bend. To find yourself, it's time. Glacier National Montana. Park. It's time. Fire ants are one of nature's most fearsome cleaning forces. Fire ants are one of nature's a most red fearsome imported cleaning fire ant forces. Army can take down prey a red much larger than fire itself and, army and take down prey clean much overnight. Dozens, even hundreds of fire ants sting in unison. And this is what humans have come to fear. The ant bites down and then stings, injecting a toxic venom that burns like, well, fire. Red imported fire ants were introduced to the United States in the 1930s, probably stowing away in ballast on a Brazilian cargo ship. Now they've spread across several southern states. The ants build large nests in the soil and once established are known to devastate the ecosystem around them. They've been known to radically reduce the number of animal species in a given area, 
sometimes eliminating them entirely with the power of the swarm. Attack on a beetle not going well? Call in reinforcements. Fire ants can aggressively take over an area and spread like wildfire. For 150... Okay, let me look at that. This is uh, a story that was one of your links, uh, and this is uh, from Scientific American on Italy facing the invasion of our American, North American gray squirrel, which certainly isn't overpopulated in our country. I mean, they're doing well, but they're not destroying anything. But they are displacing um, this very pretty uh, red squirrel. Let's go back to this Hawaii. Uh, I believe we got it right here. It is arguably the biggest threat to preser preserving Hawaii's Aina, invasive species. Today, the state and the people who have seen just how devastating this can be came together. KITV4's Lara Yamada shows us they want to beef up their plan of attack. And it's not just one or two ranches, it's growing and growing. The fireweed, threatening to take down the Big Island's ranching industry. We have maybe approaching 25% of our state land mass affected by this. Estimates are that that will double in the next 10 years and affect over 2 million of our total 4 million acres if we do nothing. The Koki frog, its screech destroying property values. A blue mussel brought here by floating tsunami debris. Our big thing is the response to, to eradicate and try to keep it from being a threat to the environment. Because of global events, we now have to be extra careful. At the state capitol today, the people fighting to control problems devastating the islands kicked off Invasive Species Awareness Week and honored those who spent years, decades, fighting the problem and raising awareness. So this is the cottony cushion scale. Darcy Oishi has been one of many researchers partnering closely with other departments to find new ways to battle back against invasive species, more recently releasing the fireweed moth on the Big Island. We have a caterpillar that feeds on it. They're now breeding caterpillars, and that's because they need it in order to, to recover their rangelands again. In other areas, workers have learned to grow their own sea urchins or use hot water to control cokies. They are but a few examples of a new way of thinking to do whatever it takes to preserve Hawaii. Each of our agencies have a different role to play, but we only play it well when we play it together. Laura Yamada, KITV4 News. The state has launched a new program online called Hawaii BioBlitz 2013, What's in Your Backyard? All you have to do is take pictures of plants or animals anywhere in the state and then post them on the Project NOAA website or the mobile app. Dozens of local experts will analyze and then identify your pictures. Just go to the As Seen On section of our website, KITV.com, for a link. Okay. So that gives you a little more insight into what uh, Hawaii has got to deal with, which is bad. <clears throat> um, aggression can occur in plants as well. Uh, the African crystalline ice plant. Uh, there's lots of ice plants here in the valley. Uh, very pretty plant, but when they get loose, uh, they can inhibit the growth of other plants by sequestering salt and the soil becomes salty, uh, too salty for native species, especially in areas like around the coast in California. There's a garlic mustard from Asia, which produces a toxic substance uh, which kills the mycorrhizal fungi. If you haven't had a soils class, or, or hopefully you've talked about it in ecology, the mycorrhizal fungi in soil is critical for continued plant growth. Uh, nitrogen um, breakdown uh, and many native plants depend on this mutualistic association and when the garlic mustard grows uh, nothing else does. Predation uh, by exotic species or invasive species uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier the, the, the rats the Norway rat, the Pacific rat, mongoose, the stoat which again we call weasel here in the US on islands, ground nesting birds have been wiped out as they didn't evolve with that type of predation. Rats have been credited with the extinction of 37 bird species on different islands. The brown tree snake is probably one of the worst. It, Hawaii lives in, in great fear. I actually 
spent about 11 days working in Hawaii on another project, uh, but all I heard about was uh, how they had to watch for brown tree snakes. This is interesting. When I, I was working with their game and fish department, they didn't call it that, but it was the same thing. Uh, and that's all those people did. Those those guys and, and gals, they they searched ships. They searched airplanes. Uh, they went around to people's yards and killed animals. Uh, and that's what conservation is in that island environment because the exotic species have become so, so prevalent. Uh, and the, uh, the brown twist tree snake is probably one of the worst stories. Uh, it was introduced uh, to Guam from New Guinea. Uh, originally, it was a tree hunter. It caused the extinction of about nine or twelve, nine of twelve endemic bird species, two uh, of eleven lizard species. Uh, you can check this this BBC film out. It, it basically only shows one tree snake, though. Um, and it, uh, it went on to mammals. And so now, now they're concerned about the native mammals on Guam. Uh, they currently, since all the birds are almost dead, now they're dropping poison mice uh, with acetaminophen, which is, you know, is Tylenol. Uh, so they, they've got dead mice laced with Tylenol that they drop out of helicopters hoping that brown tree snakes will eat it. Um, and uh, that will kill them. Um, it it it's, it's probably hard for you to understand, but it, it was hard for me to understand when I first started working, you know, almost 30-something years ago, almost 40 years ago. It's really hard to wipe a population out, and, and that's what you've got to do with an invasive species is get rid of them all, especially one that's already proven that it can reproduce so rapid, rapidly. Um, they're estimating that there could be 60 million tree snakes in Guam. So that's it, very difficult. Another example, the Nile perch. Uh, as you can see, it became a huge fish. Uh, that's why it was introduced into Lake Victoria. Uh, at the time, there were over 400 species of cichlids. Now there's about three species of fish uh, in the lake, uh, primarily. Over half the four 400 cichlids are extinct. Uh, they ate detritus, and, and the lake is now choked with algae and one dominant predator. Um, here you can see this is a paper on, uh, and it'll affect things like, we'll probably see pied kingfishers in South Africa. Well, the kingfishers are birds that eat small fish. Well, this has is, is affected the small fish population, so it affects the birds as well. Um, and this is other species, other fishes species. Uh, here's Lake Victoria, huge lake just south of Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and, and Burundi. Um, more predation. Uh, sometimes predators are brought in to control other exotics. This is probably it's probably the sad one of the saddest, but almost funny, uh, except it's too sad. Uh, a lot of islands, uh, especially Hawaii was one of them, let go mongoose to try and control rats uh, because in India, uh, mongoose kill rats. Uh, and in Africa, we will have like six different species you might see in South Africa, mongoose. The problem is most mongoose are diurnal. Most rats, especially those in Hawaii, are nocturnal. So they released a, a predator thinking of biological control, which is when you control an invasive species by another one. Um, and it didn't work because the two don't live at the same time. They're not active at the same time. So it created a huge problem. So here you've got a, uh, this is a picture of a mongoose actually killing a nene, which is a, an endangered Hawaiian goose. Uh, another example of, of biological control going wrong is, is uh, people introduced in, in the southeast United States, the rosy wolf snail, uh, to many Pacific islands to control previously introduced giant African snails. Uh, unfortunately, not only failed to control the targeted prey, which are too large for the rosy, rosy wolf snail to attack, but it caused the extinction of over 50 species of native land snails in these different Pacific islands. 
a lot of times uh, invasive species can can create huge problems through their food habits, which oftentimes is herbivory. Uh, the Russian wheat aphid in um, just three years caused about $600 million damage. Um, the European gypsy moth uh, killed that much timber in just one year in the northeastern United States. European rabbits introduced to islands have devastated mainly plant populations, often by stripping bark, killing shrubs and seedlings and sapling trees, uh, and also caused extensive erosion, uh, and they almost destroyed Australian grasslands. Uh, rabbits in Australia, I, I would suspect you, you've read about it or heard about it. Uh, here's a picture from a, a, well, several pictures from a website. I will outbreed everything that you ever loved. Um, and they really did destroy the grasslands. Uh, this is a, a website. Um, you can see how serious they've gotten about it in, in Australia, and it's because they have to. Um, but they have their own website uh, for monitoring rabbits, uh, how to get rid of them. They have been able to control rabbits for a while using a disease. Um, Unfortunately, they're, they're afraid that um, rabbits are going to become immune to this disease. And there's a reason uh, people joke about breeding like rabbits. They, they reproduce very fast. Uh, and if they do become immune um, to this bacterial disease, uh, they could take off again. And, and they're just a very dominant herbivore with no real predators. Um, oftentimes, this biological control, which I just mentioned earlier, um, where they they release one species to control another one, can be very successful. There's been some great uh, success stories. Um, going back to those hyacinths that controlled Lake Victoria, um, they're in in a, the native area of South America where we uh, hyacinth is from. There's a weevil that actually kills the plant, keeps it from, from reproducing to this extent. Um, and they have been able to successfully, on Lake Victoria, uh, reduce water hyacinth there through releasing those weevils. Um, prickly pear got established in several islands and in Australia, uh, and they've introduced cactus moth um, or a Brazilian cockneal bug um, to reduce the cacti. Uh, unfortunately, some of these uh, insects will then go island hopping and, and cause damage to native cacti. It's one of those things that if you're, if you're getting into a situation where you're going to be involved in biological control, you really have to research it to the hilt. Uh, it's, 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 and then there's several laws passed as to what types of things you have to investigate before you can do it because there's just too many examples of of like the mongoose being released to control rats when they're not even awake at the same time of day. A lot of times exotic species like this beautiful mallard um, can can breed uh, with with native species. Um, this gets released. It's such a common domestic duck. They get released in many islands uh, and have threatened uh, native species where they hybridize with them in New Zealand, uh, Hawaii, uh, and even in South Africa. We, we may see um, some mallard hybrids in South Africa. There's a very mallard-like duck there that people argue could be the same species or subspecies, uh, but then right now they're different, considered different species. Uh, hybridization can be a real negative effect even if they don't produce uh, fertile offspring. This is a, a kind of an interesting example. This is the North American mink which got released in Europe because of the fur farms. Uh, they make beautiful coats uh, so people raise them in captivity uh, to sell the furs. Of course they're going to get loose uh, and as they got loose in Europe the male North American mink are able to they breed earlier and they breed with the European mink females. They also breed with the American mink females. The European female uh, body reacts like she is now pregnant and stops um, estrus uh, and essentially 
never produces a viable embryo, and so she doesn't breed. Each year she breeds with a North American mink, uh, and the North American mink um, keeps growing while the European mink population is stagnating. You can get some, some chain reactions um, when A affects B and then C finally culminating in D and E. Uh, and they call these ecological meltdowns, which are usually impossible to predict. Um, there was a myxoma virus from North America that was transferred to the UK and affected rabbits there, uh, which caused the extinction of this beautiful butterfly species. And the, the reason why is the butterfly requires incubation in the underground chambers of ants. Ants avoid nesting. Um, in overgrown areas, which wasn't a problem because rabbit herbivory kept vegetation down. But when the rabbits were decimated, uh, the areas were overgrown, the, nance, the ant de population declined, and the butterfly went extinct during that ant population decline. Um, you can have two or more species interacting. Uh, this is an introduced faucet snail. Uh, they naturally carry a parasite which can affect our, our waterfowl negatively, um, but it wasn't fatal. And unfortunately, the second parasite it can carry was reintroduced to North America uh, and now is, is called, well, excuse me, in Europe. Now it's causing uh, duck populations to die in Europe being reduced. Fig trees are introduced in Florida. They're introduced in several areas as ornamentals or as fruit trees. Uh, they usually stay where they're planted. Um, in the southeast, they stayed where they're planted until about 20 years ago because there were no pollinating insects. Um, but when three fig wasps were mistakenly introduced, uh, they began to spread all over the southeast U.S. Mina birds uh, in Hawaii were again introduced uh, as a biological control to eat pasture insects. Unfortunately, they also eat seeds and they now are dispersing one of the worst weeds by eating and spreading those seeds. Sometimes there's multiple effects. This is the round goby, uh, which is an old world fish that arrived in the Great Lakes from ballast water of a ship. I'll show you what that is in just a second. It was viewed as harmful as it feeds on native invertebrates and eggs uh, and larvae of native fish and competes for food with native fish. But it also eats zebra mussels, which I introduced to you earlier, which were introduced into the Great Lakes. And they also eat quagga mussels, which are just as harmful. Uh, their main source, though, is the threatened endemic Lake Erie water snake. Uh, they're the main food source for the threatened endemic lake, excuse me, endemic lake Erie water snake. Uh, so there, there is a mixed, you know, they're concerned about this species because uh, it feeds on native invertebrates and larvae of native fish, but it also eats these two exotic. So it could be, it is a type of bi biological control and has become a substitute food source for an endangered snake. So, um, you can have exotics or invasive species can have several different effects. You got to see this bird here. The sound you are hearing is coming from an important South American creature that may soon be extinct. It is the call of a critically endangered hummingbird, a call unlike that of any other on Earth. The call of the Juan Fernandez fire crown. This unique flower pollinator is found only on Isla Robinson Crusoe, a 37 square mile Chilean island some 435 miles west of Chile's mainland. From 1704 to 1709, this island was home to Alexander Selkirk, whose experiences there inspired Daniel Defoe's famous novel, Robinson Crusoe. No humans lived in the Fire Crown's home when Selkirk arrived, but following the island's discovery 125 years earlier by Portuguese explorer Juan Fernandez, pirates used it to replenish their supplies and bury their treasures. With those pirates came the introduction of goats, 
cats, rabbits, and rats. Later visitors would introduce commercial deforestation and invasive plant species. Before all this, the Juan Fernandez Fire Crown had not known any predators, and the abundant plants upon which its life depended were unprepared for competitive, non-native species. The deforestation, invasive plants, goats, and rabbits destroyed much of the island's habitat and many of the Fire Crown nesting sites. Cats captured the unsuspecting birds as they fed, and rats devoured their eggs and chicks. The Fire Crown's population plummeted. Efforts are underway by volunteers and Chile's National Forest Service to stop the ongoing damage and to save the Juan Fernandez Fire Crown from extinction. Even the children, who number among some 700 persons living there, are helping to increase awareness of their national treasure by singing of the Picaflor de Juan Fernandez. But more than these efforts will be needed. It will take more education, more participation by locals, and critically, more support by those who understand that to lose the Juan Fernandez Fire Crown is to lose forever yet another of this planet's unique species, as well as an important pollinator that aids in sustaining the island's endemic plant species. You can help save the voice and the life of the critically endangered Juan Fernandez Fire Crown. To learn how, contact the Hummingbird Society on the net at www.hummingbirdsociety.org or call 1-800-529-3699. Do your part. Help save the Juan Fernandez Fire Crown. Gorgeous bird. They also showed something in that um, that film I want to touch on, and that's and that's our own pets, which are often exotic, uh, and particularly the cat. Uh, you may be a cat lover, uh, and that's fine. My wife is sure a cat lover. Uh, I'm not really a cat lover because I know how much damage they do. Up to 80 to 90 percent of predation on birds in urban areas, uh, reptiles in urban areas, is done by cats. Uh, certainly feral cats have a large part of that, but also just pets. Uh, hopefully you can help me uh, increase people's awareness of how much cats can do. Um, there's just no need to have cats outside, in my opinion. Uh, they're way too much of a killer. They're way too good at it. Um, and they've really decimated populations in many areas. Uh, and this, this Juan Fernandez Fire Crown Hummingbird is a prime example. Similar to what we talked about uh, with fragmentation, overexploitation, there's oftentimes a lag time. Um, and so even though a species is introduced, might be fine for several decades and then all of a sudden takes off, both the Brazilian pepper and the brown anole from um, ornamental planting, the pet trade were fairly isolated in deep Florida um, when they began spreading throughout the southeast U.S. They're not sure uh, why they're so easily spread now. Uh, and I just, but you can buy a Brazilian pepper tree right here in Phoenix um, and Chandler, for example. Uh, and uh, I would hope uh, as you grow as a biologist or as a professional uh, that you can plant native plants. Uh, we've got enough exotics in, or invasive species. This is the brown anole, uh, which was replacing the green anole, which is the native species. We're not sure, um, and it, it, it seemed that they were augmented by an additional release which re resulted in the increase in genetic diversity and the population began to spread. It's, it's one of those mysteries. It, a lot of times just knowing why it happened is certainly, uh, is certainly good to know, but it, it doesn't solve the problem. Um, so what do we do about it? Uh, the most important thing is to keep any more invasive species from, from moving onto an island or a, a coal continent. 
Uh, most countries have established white and black lists where the penalties for blacklist releases are growing. Um, and they're not legally admitted under any circumstances. Unfortunately, these blacklists are often very incomplete. And who enforces them? No one, really. Uh, Arizona, actually, the, the state has a very strict live wildlife and, and list. The plants are, are basically, insects are basically not regulated. Uh, it's very difficult. Um, and uh, it's often not popular. People want, oh, it's a beautiful animal. Why shouldn't we let it go here? Because they just don't understand how much damage invasive species are being have done all around the world. And a lot of these invasive species are very cool. I mean, what's wrong with a brown and old? Beautiful lizard. Uh, brown tree snakes are a gorgeous snake, but they can decimate whole pop whole islands populations uh, and causing a lot of extinction. One of the primary ways animals is moved, as I've mentioned earlier, is the, the ballast water of a ship. So a ship will take water in to help maintain its, its stability while it's in the ocean with waves. Um, and one of the things they're doing now is requiring sh ships to, uh, for example, this ship left African continent and is going to the United States. Uh, it would take in water in the African port now they're requiring that ship to get rid of the ballast water uh, a certain number of miles outside the U.S. port and take in more water that's more closely related um, to the North American because the water's close to North America and it's going to have organisms in it, um, even back, from bacteria to uh, mussels. Um, and so, the, so a lot of ports are mandating ballast be refreshed. Uh, it, but again, it's, it's, you, you're typically, you're totally dependent upon the ship's captain. Oh yeah, I did that. Uh, uh, how do you enforce it? Do you put somebody on every ship? Uh, that's really difficult. Who, who's going to be the guy that, the bad guy on the ship for a year? Uh, I wouldn't want that job. Uh, monitoring and eradication. Um, you need a really well-trained staff. Uh, more and more states, more and more countries are trying to recruit citizen scientists. More and more public education so people understand the difficulties caused by very cool animals, but that they just shouldn't be there. Um, for eradication to occur, you have to have a lot of resources. You have to have clear lines of authority. Um, the biology of the target must be well-known or well-studied. And if eradication does occur, you must be vigilant that it doesn't come right back after eradication. It's very difficult to get rid of a species. Um, they've gotten rid of some on smaller islands. Uh, they've gotten completely rid of rats. Uh, they've gotten rid of feral pigs from large islands as such as those in the, the Galapagos. Um, sometimes, though, some that were succeeded were stopped. Not for the lack of the ability, but public outcry to using chemicals or killing of vertebrates. This is a, a news article from um, mute swans in New York State. They're beautiful. They're not native. They were out competing native waterfowl, uh, and they were trying to get rid of them. Um, and the people just had an outcry, and they... So far, they have not been able to proceed with their plans. Uh, and this is from February 22nd, 2014. So you can see that education is really key, really key. You need to get involved in that. Um, now, if you can't get rid of them, maybe you can try and maintain them from growing any further. Um, three main methods of mechanical or physical control, uh, chemical control, uh, and biological control, um, or you may combine all three methods. Uh, for example, lantana in Africa requires both spraying and the physical and, and someone pulling the ropes. Uh, maintenance, the uh, main concern of long-term chemical control is other species and the development of poison-resistant strains. 
The biological control is preferred, uh, but it takes a lot of study pre-release, uh, and it may not work, or you may create um, more problems. So that's it on invasive species. This is one of the lectures where you do have a, an assignment. You are to find um, invasive species in um, South Africa. Um, and it is, oops, this isn't the right one. Um, hang on here. Thought this was all ready to go. Uh, remind me later, I don't want to change my passwords with you guys watching. Uh, let's go down here to invasive species. Uh, invasive species, this one isn't available to you guys. Find at least five invasive species that are causing conservation problems in South Africa, three of which should be vertebrates. Develop a short PowerPoint with no more than three slides per species describing the species, its origin, and how it got there, what kind of problems it's creating, what is being done to try and stop it, and include your sources at the end of the PowerPoint. That is due to me by July 13th. Okay, I will talk to you guys real quick. Bye-bye.